galaxy is much wider across the map. It's roughly 100,000 light years in diameter. Now, suppose there are planets around the nearby stars, as we might well expect. How could we detect them? You can't just look out and see a planet, because the planet's small, dim, hidden by the bright light of the star nearby. Uh, you have to do something special. Now, there are several kinds of special things that we could do. One thing that might happen is this. We might have a device at a telescope which measures accurately the amount of light coming from a star. Suppose this is the star. Suppose the planet were to pass in front of the star. We couldn't see that just by looking at the, just by looking at the star, but the starlight is dimmed a little bit when that happens. So if we connected our photocell to some ammeter, like the one we've used before, then when something passes in the way, the current goes down. And this now is a very big planet, which is passing very close to the star, so there's a big deflection of our needle. In a more likely case, there is a very small planet, which is a much bigger distance from the star, and so we'll be at just a tiny deflection. It requires very sensitive measurements, but it certainly can be done, and this is a kind of way of searching for planets around other stars, which is just beginning to be done. Now, we can think of a second way. I'm going to mention three ways, there are in fact more, but I just want to give you a sense of how it can be done. A second way is this. This, the planet, after all, shines by reflected starlight, but because it's so close to the star from our point of view, it is swamped by the bright light of the star. If we could somehow shield our eyes from the star, we might be able to see the reflected light from the planet. That's called occulting, or hiding, the star. So over here, we have a planet which is not shining by itself next to a bright light which will represent a star which is shining brightly probably be several people who will have to squint as a result of this and so here we can see that the star is clearly visible but no trace of the planet because it is swamped in the light of the star now as mr coates slides and a, a coating object in front of the star we see the planet sitting there revealed for the first time. And now if we take the occulting device away, we can't see the planet again at all. Thank you, Bob. Now, how can we actually do this in, uh, in a real situation? Well, the best way is to use a steady, large, sharp edge that's already in space to hide the star and, if we're lucky, reveal the planet. And there is such an object, it's called the moon. And if we could get in the right angle, the moon could just barely blot out the light from a star, we might then, if we had a sensitive detection device, see the light of the planet, which goes around that star. This requires space vehicles to get at the right position so that the edge or limb of the moon uh, occults appropriate stars. And that is a second technique which is about to be There is a third technique which has already been, been put in this and uh, doesn't actually involve a trolley, but center of mass, so in space they move like that, and imagine that we're lucky and that they are at this angle to our line of sight. Now, you can't see the black planet, but you can see the yellow star, and so the yellow star is doing a kind of bobbing motion. But stars also move with respect to other stars, and now I need someone to help me pull. Yes. Now, this is very easy, 
The only trouble is that the string tends to come off. Now, if you would slowly pull this while I tend to, good, that's good, you will see that the star tends to make either a spiral or a sine wave in space. Thank you very much. Now, could you just push it back here? Thank you. You have just moved the sun. There are very few people who get to do that. Thank you very much. Now, that kind of motion, to really pick it up, you have to see a few revolutions of the planet around the star. Jupiter takes 11 years to go around the sun. So you have to be very patient and make very precise motions, very precise measurements. Well, that has been done for Barnard's star. And while there is still some debate on the data, there are two groups who have worked on this data, and each group seems to find such a motion. Although the two groups don't see the same kind of motion, so they're still arguing with each other. And if that is the case, they have found one or more planets around Barnard's star, which, let me remind you again, is this tiny little star called an M dwarf. We sort of feel sorry for it just because of the name. Um, but around it, if these results are right, are one or two planets of Jovian mass, like Jupiter. And if that's true, it is a most important discovery because it's the nearest planet where we have a chance of finding such a thing because uh, a planet going around more than one star would have a very complicated motion and it would be less easy to uh, find out what it's about. Now, we will, I believe, in the next decade or two, have made a very serious and thorough search for planets around nearby stars sufficient to tell whether they're there or not. If, as we think they are there, we will have then extended the Copernican perspective and discovered that planets are a frequent, if not invariable, accompaniment of stars. If we find no or few planets there, it will say that to our surprise there's something special or unusual about planetary systems in space, and that's also, of course, important to know. Now, there's another approach to this problem, and that's theoretic. We can put in the kind of physics that we think is important for planetary systems forming out of a gas and dust cloud, and let the computer make all kinds of parts collide and see what happens at the end. So let me show you in a moment the result of a computer program at uh, which we've used at Cornell University, which does just this. It imagines a big dust cloud uh, in which there are tiny little um, lumps of matter which go through the dust. Every time they collide with a dust particle, the dust particle sticks. When the growing mass becomes big enough, its gravity attracts gas. When two of these growing planets collide, they stick. And the whole process is continued to all the gas and dust is used up. What are the results? Well, the next picture shows our solar system in a way which will be useful to understand the computer results. And we have the various planets laid out for us from Mercury here, Venus, the Earth, Mars, uh, the biggest asteroid. Those are the terrestrial planets. And you can see they're little guys, and they're in close around one astronomical unit, an astronomical unit to the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Then there comes Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. These are planets that have been shaded. They are bigger than the terrestrial planets. They're the gas giants. And you can see they're out at roughly 10 astronomical units. Well, that's the kind of system we have here. What does the computer make? Well, under some circumstances, the computer makes systems like this. And you can see it's almost identical. Terrestrial planets in close at around one astronomical unit. Jovian planets further out at around 10 astronomical units. These are cousins of our solar system. They're very similar. And while the computer requires certain starting conditions to wind up with planets like our own, the fact that with such simple physics you can wind up with such planetary systems is encouraging. Now, if the gas and dust cloud is very thin, if there's not much matter around, then we don't form big planets. We form something like a string of asteroids all the way out. 
or if there's a lot of gas and thus